I'm waiting for Amrish to come. I know doctors like me and Amrish get involved at the last minute. I'm very sure that he must be on the way. Hi. Sorry, sir. Sorry. Apologies for being late, but you know how it is with us doctors. Absolutely. As usual, I got pulled into something and what else but a patient. But my apologies again. Oh, no. So now that we are here, let's introduce our viewers to our latest exciting show, Out of Office. What does out of office mean? We're really talking of things, common things that affect all of us, but some things you don't discuss in the usual seminars, usual CMEs. And that's why let's focus on a new area today. What other factors impact patient care? We have come here to discuss about some things which we practice every day, but uh, sometimes do not discuss it so well, uh, how to master the skills of communicating with the patient, getting the feedback from the patient, so as to translate into a good medical clinical practice. As Dr. Call was saying, sometimes we worry too much about medication, about this, about prescriptions, but the patient is either not understanding what we say, is not following what we say, is not adhering to treatment, Absolutely. hasn't understood. And in chronic cardiometabolic disease management, these are very important aspects. Absolutely. It's not like a procedure that you do for a patient. It's something that you need the patient to participate in. And for that, communication becomes a mandatory communication skill. So let's talk about this. Yeah. Seems like fun. So let's go, sir. <laughs> Museum of Illusion. Very good. Come. Again, carrying on about this out-of-office concept. We're really talking today not about hardcore science in that sense, but we're talking about how to deal with patients. You know very well, sir, you know, that, that the kind of patients that we get can vary a lot. Within the same day, you will see such a huge spectrum of patients. Even though their medical condition might be the same, their parameters might be the same, yet communication and approach has to be different because they look at their disease differently. So for example, there's a group of patients who are in denial. They don't, and I have so many such patients who've spent one or two years just not accepting the fact that they have a condition called diabetes or hypertension. And the whole thing, you know, and they mess up their problem and then come back in one or two years. So this is a denial kind of patient. Then there are others, as you know, who are Mr. Fix-It, you know, I can, I can fix everything, no medication, nothing, I will do it on my own. I mean, I really don't, just give me some broad guidance, I don't want to do anything else. We still have some of those who are dependent on you, some of the old-fashioned patients who say, I don't know anything, doctor, just prescribe what you have to do. They don't take charge of their condition, which is also a challenge, as you know, sir, very well, that in chronic conditions, if you leave the responsibility totally to the doctor, you can't go very far. It has to be a shared kind of responsibility. There are also this group of patients who are very skeptical about modern diagnosis, even diagnostic criteria, who feel that doctors are taking them for a ride. And sometimes in exasperation, I have to ask them, then why did you come here? You know, if you're so sure that, that everything is wrong. So I wonder what's your experience with that kind of thing? Well, you're right, Amrish. Uh, there are also patients who have gone through Google. Yes, the and Google And they patients. think they know everything. They go to that part of the Google which is anti-statin. Yes. You have to handle that kind of patients also. You can't tell them that, oh, you're wrong. So we have all kinds of patients and every patient is a different. Sometimes the problem is not as big as it seems, sir. That's you agree right. with that? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. absolutely, absolutely. Now you come across a headmistress of a big school. Yes. Uh, she's used to, you know, commanding yes. so many teachers, so many associates, and now she has uh, these problems. Her attitude is, you know, I am going to beat this up, you know, this is easy. I'm not going to take drugs. I will do, you know, only yoga. 
I am not going to take tablet. Even if my blood pressure is 170 by 110, I will go to my way, I'll do meditation, I'll do yoga, and uh, medicine should be avoided because they have bad effects. And uh, you know, you have these kinds of patients every day, I'm sure, Amrish. So also the other way around, now, so, so there are two patients coming in with identical parameters, same blood sugar, same blood pressure, same risk. But as we discussed, one category or two categories of patients, there's another one, which is the simple Indian, you know, from, from a small town. And there you have to tell him, look, if you're not careful, you will get a heart attack. If you're not careful, you might lose your vision. If you say the same, use the same language to the earlier two patients, they will probably think you're mad or, or, or just hate you. But for this kind of patient, you may have to say that. And it works very well. So we have to constantly change our hats about communication. You know, it's not only about prescribing the correct drug. As this out of office show tries to emphasize, it's about how you deal with the patient. That will make the patient compliant to your treatment. As, as Sir pointed out, that we need to keep changing our approach to communicate with the patient depending on where the patient is coming from. As Mahatma Gandhi said, an ounce of patience is more than a ton of preaching. And it makes sense. It basically means that when a patient comes and you want to tell him something about his disease, how to put it, in what words to put in. I'll give an example. A patient comes to me with an inoperable heart disease. I can tell him, you cannot be operated, you're too high risk. I can also say, your disease is of a kind, is best managed by a good medical treatment, which will be equivalent to if we operate on you. So I prefer you be on a good medical treatment. So this is the way, you know, communicating to the patient always is important. And you don't have to scare the patient. Yes. You want that the patient should get the best treatment. At the same time, he complies with the treatment. Yes. He will comply only when he understands this is best for him. So I, I think that this is a very important point. I totally second you in that. There is sometimes a tendency amongst us physicians to scare patients. And I think, I don't think it works. I have never seen it work in my practice. And the family will often say, Inko ab dara dije. You know, yes. he hasn't understood. No, but I think often we know better. You know, so I think it's important that we understand that the purpose of communication, and we are standing in front of the image of the person who was the master of communication, in simple language, avoid using medical jargon. And the fact that you put things simply make the patient understand better the consequences of their actions and without making the patient feel depressed. I mean, as I tell my younger colleagues, think of yourself as a patient. You know, if you took your father or you went as a patient and the doctor told you, you know, that nothing can be done and it's all. So you would come down feeling so low and depressed. Absolutely. I'll give you another example. A patient is referred to me for an angiogram. He also knows that an angiography doctor call achhe se kare denge. He comes to me, I write down, admit angio. He is so disappointed. Yes. He has to be told you have come here because you have this, this, this problem. And if we look at your coronary arteries, we know whether you have a block or not. Maybe you have no block. Oh, it might be a block which is amenable to a simple procedure or a difficult thing. But that is the purpose of your coming. And if you have any questions regarding them, please ask me. We'll clarify it. And then I will tell him, go and get admitted. So the most skilled doctors sometimes don't do that well in terms of providing patient care simply because they don't emphasize this point, sir, as you're emphasizing with your years of experience, that it is important to involve the patient and not just say, get admitted for your angiogram. It doesn't work like that. You find this funny, I know. But this is a reverse room. And we're using it to highlight 
the difference in perspective, which can actually be reversed sometimes, yes. between what we as doctors see and what the patient is looking at. So I'll give you a small example of, of patients with diabetes. In India, when people with diabetes are diagnosed, the whole family is involved. And often the diagnosis of diabetes conjures up images of lifelong restrictions. It seems that life has come to an end. So people think, I can't enjoy life anymore and I'm going to end up with all kinds of complications. Whereas all that the patient has is early diabetes which can easily be managed and if the person manages it well, will have a good life throughout and a long life too. So I'm sure you face uh, that kind of yeah. thing like a complete Absolutely. opposite perspective. A person has been coughing, coughing, coughing for the last six months, is not able to sleep, he has to get up at night, he goes to XYZ, lung specialists, no relief. Finally, somebody tells him that this doctor has treated such patients and they feel much better. He comes to me, he's fixed that he has got a severe lung disease. I see his papers, I see a small slip showing heart ejection fraction, it's 20%. ECG is not being block. looked at at all. That's not being looked at all. And now I tell him, see, your problem is your heart function is weak. Yes, it's 20%. So that means only 20% of my heart is working. What do I do? See, it's not 20% from 100%. Normal is 50, 55%. And we can relieve you. We have medicines for that. Let me tell you, let's give you an injection today of a diuretic, furosemide, and you come back tomorrow. If you feel better, then we proceed with that. We do it, next day he comes, oh, after weeks I was able to sleep and, and lie down flat. Yes. And now I tell him, this is a condition called cardiomyopathy, and it has got a very good treatment. There are four pillars of the treatment. For the doctors, now, there's ACE inhibitor, there's a beta blocker, there's a you know, SGLT2 blocker, there is spironoelectron. One by one I'll start and then he gets motivated, he starts taking it. And in a few weeks time, he's a totally different person. His attitude is different. His perspective of his disease has changed. And then I show him some people, patients, who have been on this treatment for two years, three years, and they're doing very well. So I think the fixed notion in the mind of the patient of his disease sometimes is so fixed, you can only change it by demonstrating it to him in a short period of time that he is feeling better and he has to comply with this particular treatment because this treatment is a long-term treatment. I think uh, another important aspect in this is an elderly patient sometimes who actually don't want aggressive treatment and we have to respect that. And although the parameters look terrible, yeah. You know, the patient may say that I don't really want very aggressive treatment. So we have to gently explain, and this you deal with more than I do, uh, the benefits of that treatment, the low risk of that treatment. So I think uh, patient perspective is built by many things, oh, yes. by the patient's own psyche, by the family, by society, by Google, yes. and, and by all the stuff that is out in the media these days. So we have to bring the patient on track while not shattering his, his, his understanding, but gently bring him on the right path. And I think that is very important because if the doctor and patient have a different perspective about the patient's condition, you'll, either you'll be unhappy or he'll be unhappy. Because patient is looking at something else, you're looking at something else. You're looking at the numbers, ejection fraction is improved, this, that. He is looking at some other angle of the problem. So you have to tackle both. Symptomatic relief, as you demonstrated, Absolutely. is the most important You're very aspect. right. Uh, I'll give you a small example. Elderly, you said. Yes. Elderly people are prone to atrial fibrillation, you yes. know. The person comes to you that, you know, his heart is, you know, beating like anything. Do something. You tell him that that's fine, we'll do it. But you have to take a blood thinner for a very long period of time. He said, why blood thinner? I might bleed. No, you can get a stroke. And the commonest complication of atrial fibrillation is a stroke. We'll get disabled. You will not be able to look after yourself. You'll be dependent. But explain it to him. Maybe show him an example. And then he is convinced to take Absolutely. anticoagulant, 
Heart rate control, as you know, is not yes, difficult. Yes, you yes, add a beta yes, blocker and his rate is down. Yes, but that's not the end of the yes, treatment. Yes. You have to change the perspective of the treatment, his understanding of the problem. Right, right. So it means it's an interwoven thing, you know. It's a multi, multifaceted thing where patient has to be taken into confidence and also his family sometimes. Yeah. <laughs>